show how little you know. <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad to see someone's got a drop of red as well. Well done, Mark. I would have had a bottle of red, but I think it might have looked um, a bit decadent, so I, I chose cider instead. <laughs> right, well, cheers. 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 Oh, another bottle of red. Oh, even better. <laughs> I'm very pleased to see that. This will be a convivial evening. We should be doing this in, uh, you know, a... Um meeting place while we pin hoverflies or at least uh, look at photos in detail or something in june or something shouldn't we yeah. well it's an interesting thought isn't it i mean if, if this sort of system works well why not you know one could do something of this nature um i was thinking I mean, more face to face than uh, you know virtual well i've got to encourage people to come on the uh, diptus forum summer field meeting then that's that's the answer that. i've just joined uh, you have I, good. I have. I, I just want to check in with Yanis to to check everything's okay. Is uh, are we are we good to go? Yeah, 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 yeah. Everything's okay. Excellent. Thanks very much. Hi, Yanis. Good Hello. to see you again. Hello, Roger. Nice How to meet you, today? everyone. Everything okay? Thanks. How about you? Oh, not bad, mate. Not bad. <laughs> They're all on the booze. Even Yanis. better. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get something in it myself. Yeah. yeah. We'll just give it another minute and then uh, we'll, we'll make a start. Well, I must say it's very nice to be able to put names to faces and faces to names. So, oh. Adam, hello. Hi, really good, Roger. Good to meet you, mate. Thank you. You've done sterling work for us for so long and we've not oh. actually met. I know. <laughs> Lots of typing, but... Um... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And congratulations on the award, Roger. I have to say, uh, I'm deeply embarrassed. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> Thank be. you very much. But <laughs> <At all. laughs> I'll hide. I'll go red. <laughs> cool. We've got we've got a tremendous turnout, haven't we? Yeah, it's great. It's great to see see so many people. Um, okay, let's let's kick off. We, my wife's here to admit more people as we go, if, in case I miss it. Um, so yeah, Roger, I I I guess um, I can put up the slides, or do you want to say a few words before? Uh, no, I think I think. Well, let, let, let's let's just start by um, by welcoming everyone and saying how how really good it is to see so many people taking an interest. Um, I think it's very heartening indeed. I'm hoping that Frank, Frank van der Muter from the Netherlands will join us a little bit later, but Frank's busy doing um, runs with his children at the moment. He said he's just done the ballet class and he's now running his son to dancing class or something. So um, we might see him later on. Um, uh, yeah, Andy, if you'd like to kick up the slides, then let's let's see where we, where we go. Okay, no, we'll do. Okay, I think I'm going to have to sort of do the um, uh, the, the the professor whatever next slide, please, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so we've we've got an outline of of what we're what we're going to do. Um, I'll do some basic introductions, talk about the aims of the project, and then Andy and Yanis will take over and talk about uh, the prototype and demonstrate it. Sorry, Roger, I'm just going to um, that's all right. move this so I can let people in. Yeah, that's fine. We want okay. the more, the merrier. <laughs> yeah, hello, everyone. Oh, have we got more already? Yeah, there's a few more joined. Hi, Chris. Yeah, it's growing. Okay. Um, well, those of you that are already logged on, clearly you've um, you've sort of been introduced to Andy and myself and to Yanis. Um, and I suppose in the other sense of it, we've, we've just introduced everyone to each other, which, you know, we've, we've got the Facebook club and now we've actually met, which is... <laughs> <laughs> quite remarkable really um i wanted to talk a little bit to start with about the current challenges of the recording um one of the things that i find very frustrating with biological recording is that it recording schemes tend to be a bit of a a sink for records and remarkably little actually goes back out to the recorders so Part of what we're doing here 
is we're exploring ways in which we can actually feed things back to people. So some of the feedback we're looking for this, this evening is to really get to understand what people would enjoy and what would motivate them. Um, now, it's not to say that we're going to be able to deliver all of those things, you know, overnight. But I think over a period of time, we should be able to do quite a lot. Um, the project itself really emerged because I put a post on the Facebook group saying, we've not got a way of capturing information about nil records. So if you went and did a walk around your garden and you didn't record any hoverflies, it would be virtually impossible to put that into a data set. And that's really unhelpful because it's the nil records are probably as important, if not more important, at some times a year than, than the records. Um, for example, during the last summer, we had some very hot weather. And as soon as you get hot weather, hoverflies disappear, or at least they do in southeast England. Maybe they don't in the northeast or the northwest. Maybe the heat of the southeast. We're praying for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh maybe maybe the the, the 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 heat you know is is a benefit to some places certainly in scotland one gets the impression that during hot years scotland does a lot better but we do need to try and understand these nil records because um as time goes by we're seeing increasing evidence of declines in hoverflies i'm pretty convinced that that's a climate change function i don't think it's um uh, anything to do with um, uh, the traditional ideas of habitat loss and pesticides. I think they've had their impact over the previous 50 years. And I think we're now seeing the increasing impact of droughts and heat waves and floods and changing spring times, all those sorts of things. So to try and understand the biology of hover floods, we need to do some different types of recording. And that's really where um, Andy and Yanis came in. Andy came up with contacting me and saying i think we might be able to do something and so we've done a little bit of thinking um andy and yanis have made considerable steps forward and stuart and i had a uh, a conversation with them um not very long ago uh, last week and and that was that was really um very helpful um and very exciting um so we now want to, to move things a little bit further forward and actually talk to the, the community that might use such a, uh, a system. Um, and what we're trying to do is do something that is not currently represented in data capture. We're not trying to replace iRecord or iNaturalist or spreadsheets, although it might be possible to use this instead of spreadsheets. Um, we... Um, but before we actually go much further with it, we need to get the feedback from you, the people that might use it. What would make you want to use it? Would it be useful? If it's not, then tell us. Is it only going to be useful in certain circumstances? Fair enough. That's not a problem. We need to understand those sorts of things. Andy, I think you've got a housekeeping slide, haven't you? Um, <clears throat> so um, perhaps before we go much further... I ought to um, just just remind people. Um, Yanis is hopefully uh, recording this, so hopefully it'll be available to other people that have not been able to log on. Um, but just as a general point, uh, can you make sure that your microphones are muted until we get to the discussion point? Um, and Andy tells me you can you can post questions in the chat. Now, where on earth the chat is, I don't know. Um, <laughs> That's the bottom right hand corner. So you should see uh, a little speech bubble that you can type in. So somebody has already. <laughs> bottom right. OK. Right. You, you've got to bear in mind I'm a techno numpty. I don't understand these things and panic and stuff like that. Um, OK. What's the next slide? I, I can't remember. That's all right. OK. So you've um, kind of covered some of this, I think. I, I have rather, haven't I? So. Yeah. What we're at is uh, creating a demonstrator, capturing and storing records online, capturing nil returns, looking at other information. Now, one of the things that we really don't do very well with at the moment is sort of things like time of day, weather, 
other insects present. And the sorts of things I have in mind there are for those people that perhaps would like to monitor their gardens. And, you know, you might go out at six o'clock in the morning and do the round of the garden and there are no hoverflies flying, but maybe the first bumblebees of the day are flying. Well, that's actually quite interesting information. So it's worth capturing. But we haven't got a data system for doing that at the moment. So here's a way of doing it. Um, equally, um, we might be able to start to look at what's the effect of, you know, we, 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 we get a weather forecast that says it's going to be 35 tomorrow. Well, can we, can we look at it as a group using this system? Hopefully we can. And then we can actually start to say, do we get a feel for what happens on these really hot days? That could be really, really important to try and feed into the, the debate about, for example, climate change. We really don't know for certain what happens in these really hot situations. So we could hopefully get a group together that changed that situation. Um, there's lots and lots of issues about um, data entry. I mean, at the moment, we've got a fantastic team of which Adam's with us, um, who extract data from the Facebook page. Now, that's absolutely amazing, but it's pretty labor intensive. And every year when people move over and say, oh, I've been doing this for two years, I'll keep a spreadsheet. It takes some of the load off the team. And then a new person comes in and the load increases again. Well, that's fine. But if everyone, if people didn't move over to spreadsheets, then we would be overwhelmed by now. Um, now, hopefully, using this system, we might actually make it easier for people a little bit. Um, one of the problems we have at the moment for the scheme is that um, it's very reliant on a long period in the autumn when Stuart spends his time uploading data. Now, if we've got more data at the beginning of, or as the year goes by, then we can give better feedback. And that's one of the things that we're really hoping will come out of, uh, out of this process. Uh, on top of which, it's not just about what we can take from the data. It's also maybe there are things that will be useful to you. So, perhaps being able to get download your own spreadsheets or get a feel for what's flying in your in your region um, and also get some of the, the wider sort of real-time feedback. The thing I have in mind there is I'm a great fan of bird track. I think it's a brilliant system. And both Stuart and I have said for many, many years that we would like to see the hoverfly scheme being able to give some of the feedback that bird track does. Now this is this is an opportunity to do it, um, and then finally, well, sharing and exporting data. Well, you know, we we can certainly use this system to feed into the hoverfly scheme. There are things that, if it's organised in a particular way, you can download and share it yourselves with other people. Um, certainly, your data. What we don't want to do is duplicate existing systems, as I've already said, but we also need to take account of things like um, um, uh, people's privacy and so on. So, you know, we've got to try and design a system that is effective, but um, within uh, data uh, management um, uh, regulations. So we're, we're, we're unlikely to go down the iNaturalist route, which seems to put make all records available to everyone uh, and with seemingly very little um, uh, restriction on what's what's up and in the open um, I think we've got to we've got to handle this in a slightly different way um, part of the reason for that is I think I naturalist one of the big problems is that people use pseudonyms um, that that causes all, all sorts of problems so we'd like people to to actually use their own names but as part of that, we've obviously got to make sure that their personal security isn't compromised. So this is all part of that process to make sure that that um, security is not compromised. Um, I think that's probably all I need to say at this stage, isn't it, Andy? I think it's, it's over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Roger. That's great. Um, so yeah, um, 
Roger sort of introduced um, us a little bit. So Yanis and I essentially are geospatial and data specialists. Um, so we're, we're getting involved with maps and um, and data analysis and visualization through our company Maploom. So that's that's basically what we're what we're trying to do is draw on all the skills that we have for these various projects that we get involved with. We do work for people like Natural England and the UN and World Bank and. Yanis is based in Greece and has been doing some work with the Ministry of Culture there, mapping UNESCO sites and so on. So all of that sort of expertise we're trying to bring to bear on um, developing a system that is online, that is um, very interactive and responsive. And you know, we're going to show you some of that today, but obviously we're talking about a prototype. So this is a kind of step in the right direction. Um, so, so that's where we're coming from. Um, so as I say, it's a prototype, it's not a final version or it's not fully operational, but we have built it online. And I say we, Yanis has done most of the, the clever stuff. Um, we um, have already linked it to Facebook and the login. So that's potentially really exciting in terms of some of the future potential. Um, and Roger and Stuart have given us the snapshot of the HRS database, which has 1.4 million records in it. I think it's just gone past 1.5 million, um, Stuart was saying the other day. So, um, you know, we've got a, a pretty recent snapshot of the full data set. Yeah, I think, Gandhi, what we've what Stuart sent you is a, a set of what we call unique records. Yeah. So he's he's stripped out the, the duplication yeah so it's a it's a phenomenal data set I, you know I, i'm not aware of any any like it in in the sort of wildlife recording but um you know it's it's amazing and so um the plan was to to try to create a system that not only leveraged what was there but also um allowed online data entry into a web database so that it's in a central place. You know, it's not on that isolated spreadsheets. It goes into a, a secure system in one place that then you can use that as a source of truth for, um, you know, further further analysis and visualization. And, you know, the good thing is it's on it's online. It doesn't need any software installed. It just needs a browser and, um, and you can basically access it and query your records. So, Basically, what we're trying to do is um, firstly concentrate on the bit at the moment, which um, involves the spreadsheet um, and, and capturing spreadsheet records. So, um, you know, that's things like the, 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 the recorder name, the place um, that you capture and so on. Um, but we don't want to enter that multiple times. So we've got this concept of a recording session and we'll come back to talk about this in the discussion. But essentially what it is, is that um, you know, um, th there are certain things that are repeated in the current spreadsheet records that we could capture only once. So things like who's doing it, so who's doing the observing, so that can be captured automatically from the login. The date, you know, can um, default to a single date for, for the um, records that we're talking about. Um, and then we want to enhance it with some further things that Roger mentioned, so perhaps time of day and some weather information. Um, but also the site typically would be a single entry for multiple records. So again, we don't need to enter that multiple times. We, we aim to do that once. And then crucially, this, this idea of being able to add a nil return. So I might go out at a certain time of day, as Roger said, and might not find anything as I did a couple of times this morning on tea breaks. And, um, and but, but, you know, to be able to record that, that I didn't find anything might be useful. Maybe not so much this time of year, but certainly in hot weather and, and things, um, you know, that there's periods where we can, we can capture that. So that's the, the recording session as such. So it's this kind of group of information that doesn't change with the records. But then we have multiple records or observations that we capture. And again, this would be in the spreadsheet but as a unique row so it's the species and we can pull up the list and have options for the aggregate and species level um but then populating all this other information as well that that is specific to a particular record so the gender the numbers um you know the method users it photo specimen uh, visual sighting etc who verified it if, if it was verified um by by somebody via facebook and again, we'll come back to that. But then any other comments about, about the record? So fairly standard stuff. If you use using a spreadsheet, you'll, you'll recognize those. 
and at the moment we have a sort of a sort of step-by-step -step way of going through the data but we, we think we've got ways that we can speed that up that process up so the whole idea is 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 trying to make the the, the entry easier and quicker and and more reliable because we're using controlled lists where you can't mistype and um you know there's various other checks we can do like with references and so on 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 locations um and ultimately it'd be nice to be able to you know add those locations from a map rather than having to enter them and so on um, and then, as Roger said, um, we also have the option potentially to add other insect groups in. So anyway, th th that's the observation. So this idea of a session and then multiple observations that go with that session. And then basically all of that gets fed into the database. And in theory, you should then be able to pull it back and, and have various um, dashboard elements and things that are either particular to your own records, you know, they're your records at the end of the day, they're not the, the schemes, that the scheme just creates them, brings them all together, but you've, you've been out and captured them. So they belong to you essentially, and we want to kind of reflect that back. And, um, and so on, on the dashboards that we're thinking of, you'd get various highlights and, and so on. Um, and lists, you know, species lists and, and, and what have you. So we'll, we'll come and have a look at that a bit, a bit uh, in a bit more detail. Um, also, the ability to have a map. So again, either looking at all records or a particular species, or just your records, and be able to filter and click. And that's something you know. This is our bread and butter work, really. Yanis and I work on all sorts of systems that do this sort of thing. Um, and then, obviously, to get the information out, um, you'd have something like the current spreadsheet. So you know, uh, the ability to to represent it in a form that is on a record basis that combines the session information with the observations, and um, gives you this uh, ability to export it in the way that we need to 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 have it in in the main system. But there's obviously a lot more potential there to, to you know, share data automatically and, and, and you know, share data with other systems using APIs, but let's part that for now. Um, and then finally, before we come on to the demo, there's also the possibility to be using the system for verification as well. So at the moment, what happens is we have Facebook and um, records get verified that way and then put into the spreadsheet. And then there's this kind of second um sort of pass over the data before they're exceeded into the um you know uploaded into the, the main database there's the possibility that we could you know because we're entering directly into a database that there might be an um it might be possible to incorporate some of the verification directly from what's going on in the in the in the platform so you could almost choose certain records that you wanted to submit for verification and generate a post automatically and that's one of the things that Yanis has been looking at is how this communication can improve the efficiency of the data capture from Facebook so that people don't have to take the records um, from the actual posts so we'll, we'll uh, again, we can discuss that in a bit more detail. But then I guess there's also the possibility, and and you know, I'm not sure how how far up the chain I would get on this one, but um, but the ability to self-verify records. So you know, I guess with experience comes you know certain species come easier than others, and it might be that you could self-verify some records, um, which then go through some quality checks afterwards. So um, that's the idea. Does anyone have any immediate questions before we jump into the demo? Okay, let me um, let me jump out of the presentation shortly. And I'm gonna share my screen again, but this time. Can you all see that? Sorry, I can't see my screen now. Are you, are you, are you nodding? <laughs> uh, we can see it. Well, I can see it. Right, great stuff. Sorry. Um, excellent. Thank you very much. Oh, there you go. <laughs> right. So this is the the data entry form, and you know, it, as I said, we're we're connected to Facebook. It's automatically pulling my name in from the profile, and I guess you know, there's obviously some data sharing issues. You'd have to opt in for for it to allow you to drag your name across and and so on. We have ability to enter a date and it will default to the current date or you can use date selector, you know, just as you would 
um, on any other online systems. This new ability to add the time of day that you're looking at, so you could enter you know, a, a recording slot, ability to add the weather, and these were the classes that Roger um, suggested. We've got ability to add a temperature if it's known, and then we can start to use some of the web websites um, functions to remember previous records. And again, for something like the site, what I envisage is if you put in a, a grid reference, some of this would automatically populate. But for now, we're just doing it as a, a kind of manual form. And then at that point, you would have the option to, to break out and submit a nil return or carry on and add observations. So if I just go through and I don't know, let's just say for argument's sake, I've got a, a, a back at a Langata. It's a female. There's one. By the way, if I uh, pronounce things wrong, <laughs> that's because I've not heard them said out loud before. So uh, bear with me. Um, there is no rule, Andy. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. That's my fear too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's very much a virtual thing up until now. So it's great to see so many people and, and to actually see some like-minded spirits anyway. So, um, yeah, so basically we, we step through this step-by-step -step process, you know, so add the, the species, add the, the number and gender, we'll add a, a, a method of, of, of how we saw uh, or, you know, how we, what we, how we observed. And then you can add a verifier. So, you know, and then the Facebook link, I won't add these in now, but, you know, that this could be um, linked to the, the various um, Facebook, just as we do in the in the current system in the spreadsheet. And then you might put a comment, so say a Hebrew or something like that. And then at that point, you're ready to save. And and for each session, you start to build up a list of, of the species. And, and we've only returned a few of the columns that we actually collect here just to visualize it. But the idea is that then you might then go back in and say, actually, well, I saw something else. And we think we can speed this whole process up by um, allowing um, you know, a, a much quicker interface where you don't have to step through step by step. And we'll come back to talk about that a little later. But if I just carry on through the process again and you get the idea. Um, again, I'll put Chris. Uh, and I'll just add a comment. And then basically, um, that's down ready to be saved. And when I save that, it's then promoted to the database. So I just have to refresh the, the screen, but now these numbers will all have updated. You, you won't have seen that, but, but basically these numbers in here would, would all be live linked. And so what you're seeing here is these are my, my record. This is my list just from iRecord. I, my spreadsheet hasn't been incorporated yet for this year, but you can see some of the species that I've returned and some of the things I've posted on iRecord. I'm a bit of a low lister compared to some people, but um, yeah, there's, there's a few there. And, um, and then at the top, obviously, we've got the, the sort of summary elements where we, we start to think about dashboards. So, you know, we, we want to add sort of the sites that we're maybe working at, the total species, that, you know, so this might be for all records or we could filter it just for our records. So this is showing all the species in the database plus the eggs and everything at the moment, which will need to be stripped out. The total numbers where we can actually identify a number, and that's not straightforward because, you know, sometimes we record things like frequent, occasional, or, you know, 50 plus, or, you know, um, absolutely loads, or what people write down on the records. So we can only, at the moment, work on dashboard elements with things that are actual numbers, but we might be able to convert data um, in a way with some rules to, maybe look at different ways of representing that information. But the idea is that you'd be able to, um, you know, filter this for your own areas, look at individual species, and then, you know, do things very interactively. Um, and then obviously, for, because we're mapping specialists, we, we'd also include a, a map element. So um, this is a bit uh, sluggish at the moment because it's um, pulling in a load of records, but, um, the idea is that you're able to, um, you know, view different filters here. So it might be my sites, my species, you know, all species do a comparison with what I've seen versus what the scheme has seen, um, you know, the filters for time and, and this, that and the other. So at the moment, that's um, that's as far as we've got with the map. But this is actually all operational in the sense that it's reading it directly from this database. 
Um, so this is my my records in the database again, um, but we can pull back for anybody. And I think this is Roger, but you might be able to tell me otherwise. But you know, these this is the individual um, records. Now you wouldn't be able to see other people's records, but you would be able to see aggregates of records which in this in this online database will feed these platforms so um that's the that's the idea um so let me go back in here um at the moment we haven't put anything for the actual records but the idea here is that this would be a the, the data formatted in the way that they currently are now in the spreadsheet because that's our minimum requirement and then you'd be able to export it um for yourself if you wished so that's where we are currently um, on the prototype. And then if I just jump back into the presentation, um, sorry. then we've got a few mock-ups and then I guess this is where we really want to open up the discussion. So if I just um, basically just show you these quickly. So I think, in terms of data entry, having multiple things on the screen at the same time and not having to expand lots of um, scrolls and things is, is a much quicker way of doing it. So we had the idea, this is a kind of a mock-up I came up with, this is just in PowerPoint, but you get the idea that what we want to do is to, once you've entered records over a period of time, to be able to fine tune it to what you've been seeing recently. And so that you could essentially um, get a list of all your most common species and then basically just click on them and then choose to add the information just by a series of clicks. So you just go click, 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 you know, visual sighting, uh, Chris Allen verified, this is a comment. And then if I want to add a male as opposed to a, a female, I just click on that and I would get the uh, another line in here and I'd be able to go through again. So this this interface hasn't been created yet, and Yanis is probably having a heart attack um, thinking about how he's going to do this. But um, you know, this is um, this is all, um, all all just sort of attempts to try and speed up the the data entry process and make it as simple as possible. And and also because we're generating these these sorts of lists, we can then turn that into maps to say you know what have we, what have people been seeing lately and. Um, you know, it's like the moss flying tonight thing. I don't know if you've seen that. And see, Josie's on the on the call, um, but she'll, she'll be familiar with it. But um, it's um, it's kind of just tells you what you're likely to see at any one point of time. So, for obviously, for people who are early out, uh, starting out, and aren't familiar with that many species, it's a really good way to to kind of get a bit more more direction in what you might be observing in, at any one particular time. So it would come up with your most frequent species and, and we could actually just create a top 20 all, all time species across the whole scheme, but we might even be able to fine tune it to our own records. And then obviously if it doesn't fall within there, then you'd just click a more tab and be able to choose it in a more manual way, but then still be able to enter in a, in a, a very visual type way. So that, that's kind of the idea for that to speed all, all of that recording up so that you don't spend ages scrolling through drop downs. Um, and then the idea is that we'd come up with something a bit more like this where, you know, we need to work out what goes on the dashboards, but we can include totals and filters and breakdowns and things like the, the flight period and all sorts of um, potential really for the dashboards. And that's one of the things we want to sort of pick your brains about. Um, and then similarly for the map, you know, the, the, there's the ability to filter with little chips at the top of the map and look at specific species and you know play around with time um, bars and downloads and so on so um that's that's basically what all i wanted to say at this point and and really we're just opening it up now to to kind of get your views really and i guess to try and understand you know obviously this is coming from my perspective as a recorder i i kind of um you know, I, I go out and I tend to walk around the garden and I've got a couple of sites where I've got permissions to collect and, and so I might spend more time there and, and, and be a bit more in depth. But, you know, my recording might be very different to other people's and, and, and that's what we're trying to understand is, you know, what do you do typically? What challenges do you find with the current way that we do things? And 
um, how can we make it better? You know, how can we help? And, and obviously, for the for the people who are dealing with larvae, um, like Jeff and um, and others, you know, we 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 we, we recognise that at the moment that 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 you might have more specific needs and and things that you want to do. So, I'm going to be quiet at that point and maybe hand back to Roger briefly and then open it up for questions. Uh, yeah, well, thanks, Andy. I think that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, just one small observation that people might be wondering about: um, the sort of model we have for the um, for, for the the fast data entry approach is very much along the lines that um, the bird track uses. When you first enter bird track, you have to put in your record, and it's for a particular site and so on. So you build up a, a species list for your site, and it becomes easier as time goes up, time goes by. Um, now, that hopefully will be something like the model that we're looking at here. Um, obviously, we've got a little way to go on that, but but ultimately, the idea is that it should be a, a pretty quick way of doing it, and hopefully, a little bit quicker than we find. You know, having to do multiple lines on a spreadsheet. Um, mm -hmm. Having said that, not everyone likes online systems so this isn't going to become you know you have to do it that way you can still run your own spreadsheet um but it's it's really a question of let's try and make it as user friendly as possible um what i would like to see is something that was more user friendly than let's say um uh, i naturalist which is attracting quite a lot of people um i feel that if we get better um, interaction and give people a lot more feedback, then hopefully it'll encourage people to record. I've seen a few comments coming through. Jeff Wilkinson made a useful one about uh, about larval records. I'm sure we can pick that up. Um, really, it's over to you. What what do people think? What do they want? I've got a few thoughts. Go for it. Hello? Uh, data connectivity so i enter all my stuff straight into my phone in the field obviously when you're hitting save on that it's going to have to have an internet connection presumably at the moment uh yes potentially but yanis there are options there is, is that right uh, yes, up to now, uh, we, we are using uh, the web form system that you will, I, I guess as you work up to now, you go to the field, you collect your data, and then you go to your office, to your desktop, and enter the information. There is there a thought about creating uh, an online system that you could do it on, uh, on the field. So we could make the application responsive so it can be used from your phone at the in, in the field and if you use the camera of your mobile phone then you have enabled gps it's you can enter more information automatically because the photo can be directly uploaded it has the information of the position time uh, maybe the position and time can give us from a service the weather also so you won't have to enter anything yeah, that's, that's... Name, weather position photo all yeah, where, where the position at, yeah, that, that all was sort of, like they, they were sort of three separate things that are kind of all related once you've got it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When I mean, you're using it in the field on your phone, which speeds yeah. up entering data at the time. Though I know there are differences between converting that long into grid reference, I think, but then you guys are probably know better than me. Though. Yeah, don't worry about that. That's worry. our, that's our <laughs> that, we eat that for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, a lot of people get messed up with that, but, but yeah, it's just quite straightforward once you know what you're doing. So yeah, well, no, it's a really I, good point though. I picked up that Mark was potentially using MapMate. Um, there's no problem with uh, with MapMate for us. We, we have a copy of MapMate and it's possible to do uh, MapMate syncs. Um, so you can just literally sync with us and send your records that way, Mark. Yeah, and um, there's a question here from Wout as well. well. Can I just say, oh, I sorry. haven't actually used MapMate yet. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, well, welcome to the wonders <laughs> of it. Yeah, yeah. so um, I, you know, I, I, I work on Mac and I had to buy a cheap PC to kind of get it to submit my moth records and I haven't got my head around it yet. 
Um, I'm just about the finished moth recording, I guess, but for the year. But um, it, there are just so many systems now. You know, I'm just wondering what, and I, I know nothing about technology. So does this system offer anything over and above MapMate or would MapMate fulfill the same functions? I don't know the answer to that. It's just a question. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I, I think, and it kind of relates to WAP's question as well, I guess, that, that there are a number of systems out there and we need to, to to look at what they offer and what this is doing differently. I mean, I think the the immediate difference is for the scheme itself and the ability to, um, you know, provide this direct feedback to provide proactive, you know, challenges potentially where you could, you know, engage the group to try and do something you know like fill in squares and I know there are certain things like that already but there are there are a, a number of things where it where it could differ um, and 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 I think the main one might be around this verification and the linking with Facebook because this group is so active on Facebook um, yeah. that, that I think the efficiency saving there could be the the big difference between any of the, the other mm -hmm. systems. I think the the thing I would say is that probably the vast number of data entry systems is not the issue um recording schemes can cope with all of those in one shape form or another it's frustrating but you can cope with them the more important issue i think is whether um schemes are able to actually feed anything back to the users and as i mentioned in my introduction i i've always felt that schemes tend to be a sink rather than a, than a spray. And I've always thought as a, a recorder, or as a recording scheme organizer, it's actually, if we want the scheme to be really active and functional, people have got to get something back from it. It's we, we shouldn't just be this black hole. So I think that's where this system really comes in, that we want it to feed information back out. Um, and it's it's probably going to take a little while to get to the point where we've we've got you know all the things that people would like. Mm. But hopefully we'll do something that does make it more exciting, more interactive, and and actually says we are actually doing what we want. I think I agree. There is a problem with proliferation of entry apps from a user, but I don't, but the but the hoverfly recording scheme isn't going to solve that problem. <laughs> Essentially, no, we're not. No, someone no. central needs to come along and go. Yeah, we yeah. make this this super thing that everybody can use, and and that's not going to. Yeah, yeah. From a data management perspective, biological recording is an absolute mess. <laughs> you know, it really is. <laughs> if, uh, I I you know, Janice and I write all data um, strategies, and you know. I don't, wouldn't even know where to start with with biological recording in the UK. It's all over it's the shop. Total, I mean, from a craft <laughs> perspective, you know, it is total chaos. Um, you know, the <laughs> NBN has no relationship to the BSBI um, database, and then there's the I record database, and the recorders are scratching their heads, and, and birders do something completely different. <laughs> yeah, <Sorry>. and. <laughs> yes, again. And, and yesterday, Steve Gregory um, posted on Facebook and one of the groups that, oh, you, you know, you don't want to look at that map. It's it's based on NBN. Well, NBN is supposed to be our <laughs> single source of truth for biological recording, but it kind of illustrates the point that NBN isn't keeping pace with all the different schemes, and we can't possibly solve that problem. And you know, but what we can do is make it easier for for the scheme and and but by improving data entry improving verification why it's also just posted about you know potential to use artificial intelligence for helping to recognize species and you know it might come to the point where you could do something where certain species um at certain times were were, were identifiable that way but you know that's a whole can of worms potentially yeah. that's why that that isn't it yeah. It's probably worth mentioning that Stuart and I have actually played at it. Well, Stuart has, and I've played. Um, and I think ultimately we may be able to get somewhere with the AI approach. Um, the biggest issue is actually is one of time, actually. Um, Stuart started to play with it, but getting really good quality photographs into the system, verified, 
and then allowing the system to interpret those photographs is an incredibly time-consuming process. Um, and it really sort of fell over because neither Stuart nor I had the time to chase through hundreds of photographs, or actually probably millions now, and come up with a set that the AI system that he designed could actually start to use. Um, so let's not rule it out, but it's probably a little way down, down, the, down the list at and, the and, moment. But paradoxically, you've got the, probably the biggest archive of verified photographic records oh, yeah. of anywhere. So you know, that, that is a <laughs> potential resource to, to harness it. And I'm going to yeah. keep quiet here because Yanis will probably um, have, have thoughts on this. But we, we are doing um, some, some AI stuff on satellite imagery, but you know, that, that's a different um, proposition, what, what we're talking about there. But well, you have an amazing source. The, the AI yeah. system is probably something that we ought to ultimately be talking between ourselves, our colleagues in the Netherlands, um, and one or two other um, parts of Europe. I mean, I think this is where the, the potential power of a whole um, Europe of, of, of technical specialists would come in. But at the moment, you know, the Hoverfly recording scheme has a very limited skill, uh, resource of technical specialists. Uh, the same thing holds in the Netherlands, in Germany, in France, etc. But if we can get everyone together, maybe we can use the power of that whole group yeah. to make something work because they wouldn't all have to do the same amount of work but well, that's good. somewhere down in the future i think that, that's good for validates anyway i don't think it solves it, it doesn't solve the problem of what this app's for because if you have it's it's ai is good for validators but if you start using it to identify things in the field people stop going out and doing it because you don't get that hit of you learning yeah 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 ah. So yes. Right. Um, sorry, I'm just picking up on the chat. Um, the, there was um, it, there's a good point here that 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 Wout saying that it already exists in in um, Belgium for verification yeah. of fifty I, species. I fixed which... my, my my microphone. Oh, hi there. Hear me. Oh, hello. Bruce. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, oh, I'm uh, one of the together with Frank. I'm one of the validators for um, surface flies on the. Waarneming in Pen so it's the Belgian version of observation.org. Um, and we use the same list of automatically validated um, species as in the Netherlands. Uh, there they choose about uh, 50 uh, species uh, of hooverflies, which, which are uh, validated automatically based on photographs. Um, and the recognition level of the artificial intelligence is set to 98 or 99 percent, I think. So that keeps out uh, the the very bad um, pictures because more and more people tend to use their uh, uh, cell phone for, to take pictures, and they sometimes there are only just a few pixels uh, and that's unrecognizable and then you get uh, strange results um, but that really functions well um, and it comes with an application for your smartphone uh, both android and apple uh, in which you can enter in the fields almost all the information you were presenting except for the weather conditions that's not included at the moment. Um, and that's also connected to this artificial intelligence. So what we see now in the recent years is an uh, immense uh, increase in people um, recording mostly large hoverflies, mm -hmm. um, like the Eristalis, Helophilus, uh, these kind of species. So it's a limited number of 20 to 30 species. And unfortunately, all the Hyalosia and um, Heringia, Neognemodon, um, all the small black ones um, are hardly ever photographed. So that's up to the specialists to collect them. Um, so in my opinion, I think you're kind of like trying to invent something that's maybe already existing. And it might be worthwhile to 
um, have a look at that system um, and the associated application to see if that um, fits your needs or not. Um, and why one of the issues you were uh, talking about was uh, privacy. Mm -hmm. As an um, user of observation.org, you can choose to put all your species under um, um, under embargo, so nobody can see them except the validators. Or you can um, choose to um, uh, to um, oh, sorry, sorry for my English. Um, so you, you can uh, choose to uh, show them only at the five kilometer kilometer square. Yeah. So the data is entered um, at um, meter level at meter um, at meter level, but um, for other visitors, it's only possible to see it at the five kilometer square. So it can be used to generate general maps for uh, species distributions. Um, and the validators can use it for um, more complicated um, calculations, but other people cannot see who uh, recorded the, that specific fly at that location, nor they can see the specific location of that fly. So that can, that's also used for more um, rare species, which are um, vulnerable to collection or, uh, or things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Um, I, I think you're right that we we have to have a look at what what's out there for sure. Um, we don't. We said along. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. I think if it provides the the the, the AI, we weren't looking at AI um, at the moment. But it, it, I guess it's whether the other things do the job. And as I say, at the moment, most of the things we've looked at don't really provide the sort of immediate feedback, um, and and so on. So we can see. Um, were there any any other thoughts? It's, most people use bird track, I think, um, potentially, or have mentioned bird track and eBird. Well, it's quite interesting, actually, that Mark commented that um, none of the birders that he knew actually use bird track. I th I think this is actually part of the problem that we've got that we're now seeing a range of other um, platforms coming through and people using them because they're easier. Um, my one observation would be that um, I think, as with iNaturalist, a platform that makes data entry easy doesn't necessarily make data usage easy. And that is actually, I think, part of the problem that we, if, if you look at platforms that only make it easy for the, um, uh, for, for the inputter, it actually limits what you can do with the data. And what we're trying to do is to actually move into a slightly different paradigm where we can start to use data entry platforms to answer some of what are going to be ultimately probably really, really important questions. Um, so we'll make it as simple as possible, but it's going to compete with other platforms, I'm afraid, you know, and People will choose, you know, they might prefer iNaturalist, they might prefer iRecord, they might prefer Spreadsheet, they might equally prefer just to put it on the Facebook group and let our data extractors extract the data. Um, or they may put it on MapMate or Recorder and do a MapMate or Recorder sync. You know, it's <laughs> poor old Stuart's just got to deal with the whole lot. <laughs> Sorry, can I just step in for a second? Yeah, because from the point of view of being one of the extractors from Facebook, I think yeah, one of the reasons really why the, the recording scheme has become so successful is that Facebook is just so a familiar brand to deal with. People yeah. know that it, it's very easy. Go on, put your picture on, put your comment on, then they get a verification for one of the team. And as you said, it, it, it's getting so complex in terms of the variety of different mediums now in terms of iRecord, iNaturalist. People who just want a quick ID, Facebook's your place to go, really. And I think what needs to be considered is, you know, is Facebook still going to be the place to go? And then we use this tool as an addition. 
And then if so, how does the likes of me and the rest of the recording team do that? Do we still use a spreadsheet? Do we then go on to this new system? Um, and, and don't underestimate the powers of new, a relatively new hoverfly spotter. The benefit of being able to scroll down that Facebook page and see oh, yes. a load of photos in a in a in a in a quick go and go, oh, that's what it is. T it, totally. It, it, I've obviously got Roger's book, but like it it, it, it it the number of times you do that, although less so with hoverflies now, more with other things now. But that as a beginner, that's really powerful. Yeah, I, I think I don't think we, we we definitely don't want to lose the community um, aspect of the Facebook and and this instant verification and all this lot. Um, what I think it's more about how can we make it easier to get the data out of that into the database format. And you know, we we, we obviously yourself and Chris and others who are in, involved in the extraction. Um, you're the best people to design that and and work out you know what would work for you and because there must be a, a better way of doing it uh, than than just manually transcribing it from um from there but I, i'm not i'm not involved i don't have sight of that process but i imagine it's just a case of going through the posts and putting it into the spreadsheet copy paste copy paste Yanis, do you want to <laughs> yes Yanis. i knew that very well adam <laughs> Janice, did you have any thoughts um, on that? Because you're the, the, the you've been looking uh, at Facebook. I was intrigued by disobservation.org, and I just signed up and seen the information, just understand what uh, what is there. Yeah, it's very interesting. It has a, it, it's but it's a generic platform, so you can I, as I can see here, you can record the date, uh, position, and some kinds of type. But I feel that here we have a lot of concepts that are not included so the concept of verification for example the concept of diffusion to uh, to facebook the concept of sticking to our um, process our known working process so one of the main things that came up in the discussion is that people don't want to change the way they are working it's good it's bad i don't know but people are used to working in a methodology so we try to adopt to what you already know and then make it more efficient, make it uh, more clever, and give you the option to change, to shift to another paradigm. Now, all other things that, um, that, uh, that Roger uh, mentioned about AI, about the potential is, 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 gre is great. I mean, you can do all sorts of things, connect to, to climate change, uh, connect to uh, space, your neighbor, uh, a lot of things, a lot of things. I think that having all this data and adding all this data that are there from, when was the first observation, Andrew? I thought it's something like in... I don't know, Roger will be able to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I was amazed to see it. I mean, they were, you were writing that in paper, I guess, right? Yeah. No PC back then. <laughs> Cards and and things, I guess. But um, uh, well, yeah. when we when we started, it was cards. And when Stuart and I took on the scheme in 1991, we inherited two cubic meters of record cards. I then spent the next five years, uh, all winter, transcribing those cards onto a database. Um, the best day of the year was Christmas Day. I could I could hide from the family, and uh, and spend 14 hours. At the database and I get maybe a thousand records, fifteen hundred records put on. Um, that that five years we changed the data set from about fifty thousand records on computer to three three hundred and seventy five thousand. Um, and of course now we're at one point five million, but you know it's 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 growing by around about uh, well, at the moment, we're now at the stage where we're growing at 100,000 records a year. Now, if you imagine doing that on cards, I think we'd need a few people. <laughs> so it has moved on. Um, but it's it's become more demanding in the process. But at the other side, look at it. We've got a – this is fantastic. We've got a, 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 a Zoom meeting with 20 – 21 22 people on it we wouldn't have had that with cards 
So it's great. I've all been in the pub though. <laughs> um, in those days, we didn't manage to get Diptris Forum members out of the, the lab and into the pub. Um, <laughs> we've worked very hard on it, and we even occasionally get Peter Chandler down the pub now. <laughs> but some of us have to go at, 11, at, at 9 o'clock. You know, it's essential. I'm just looking at Josie's post. Did you want to say? Do, do you do you want to say anything more about that um, online recorder that you mentioned? Um, that, that's, that sounds like it might be similar to what we're trying to do. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, yeah. I mean, the Norfolk Norfolk Moths website is really good, and has this um, like online recorder thing, which I don't know if I can show which if that might be of interest yeah um well we can certainly take a look at it i mean we're we're quite happy to take the best of whatever there is and if people um think there is something positive to be had out of one of these groups let's look at the options but what we're trying to do very much is to um is to try and you know draw people in and make it more of a community and more interactive yeah yeah definitely i really like the look of what you've put together already i think it's really cool um i mean yeah the, I, hopefully that's working mm -hmm. yeah, share, but, fine. but yeah i mean you can see they've already got like all the different options here and you know you can just just, just a question. So, so, and and what was the motivation for this, uh, as opposed to sort of doing it through the moths sheet on iRecord, say, or something like that? <laughs> um, I think I, I might know the answer. I've been used it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I record is uh, problematic in itself. <laughs> um, I think I, I think the issue with with moths, especially, is that um, every county does it individually as well so it's very um it's kind of just up to each county recorder as to their preferences mm -hmm. so i'm helping um the hampshire recorder at the moment trying to to make streamline things a little bit in hampshire and work through the i record stuff as well um and he tends to use mapmate as a preference which um i'm not a fan of but you know i think anything that can be done to to streamline these things is is going to be going to be good but yeah i think on certainly from my perspective online recorders are, are going to be a much more user-friendly way of doing things hmm. yeah i i guess that you know there's there's lots of systems it's it it, it you know it doesn't have to be one if, if they're built in the right way that are interoperable and share the records in the right way you know that's that that's that would be that would be fine you know and it's then up to people to decide which is the the one they want to use um you know i, I as i said we, we don't want to duplicate effort here this is this is about trying to make things better and i think as i say it's about this feedback and verification um that i think we can add the most value from what i've seen um but yeah we need to understand that that next step if it literally is just copying and pasting then we need to look at what's possible to to try and make that easier and you know maybe pre-enter their information um for some users like the people who do spreadsheets could could only submit as a post for identification certain records you know there's, there's lots of scope but you know some of them are easier than others i suspect yanis <laughs> i see a very interesting post here saying about negative uh, records That's... yes i'm just ca catching these as we go come up yeah 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 it's very interesting if you can see it. Yeah. Can I? So Roger, sorry, go on. Sorry, go. Can I? Um, I sort of record a whole range of things, and I suspect because people have talked about moths and birds, and I, I suspect quite a few recorders do that. So they're not going out specifically to look at hoverflies. Um, and that can impact on sort of time issues. 
um, that if you're looking for all, you know, you may spend half an hour because there happen to be a number of butterflies around, and then you go back to looking at butterflies because something crops up. Um, it it's got to be, you've got to be careful that you're not making assumptions about what people are doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let maybe just as a quick show of hands, who 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 on the call records other things other than hoverflies? I suspect most of us. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I, I think I, it's probably worth just reflecting a little bit about this. Um, the individual records aren't going to tell you very much. It's the power of getting a large number of people recording that will start to tell us something. Um, and the more records we get, the to some extent, the noise will be drowned out. But the other side of it, we can use, for example, um, the, the same sort of approach as with bird track. I mean, bird track actually asks, is this a complete list? Now, that's a complete list as far as the recorder is able to do. Um, now, we can do the same with, with this system. And then we can filter out the casual records and just look at the complete lists. And and that, I mean, if you look at BirdTrack, the um, the um, the charts that they produce are all based on complete lists rather than casual records. Um, so what we would be very keen to do is to is to create a system that has the ability to draw in data from a very wide range of sources, but also data that's specifically generated, for example, by walking around your garden and doing a garden list. Um, now, that sort of thing, you walk around the garden, tick off the species that you've seen, or you've walked around the garden at nine o'clock in the morning, there's nothing flying except two bumblebees and a, uh, and a cabbage white. Well, you put the cabbage white and bumblebees down, and it's a complete list, but it tells you at nine in the morning, nothing's flying apart. From, but it does actually tell you something else. It says hoverflies might not be, but there are other insects that are actually doing OK or that are out. And these are the sorts of things that at the moment there's very little research data on. Um, even with hoverflies, the only person that's actually done a lot of it and published was Francis Gilbert. And he did that 40 years ago. Um, I got a MSc student to repeat Francis's work, but to extend it into the, the very early morning and into the evening. And, 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 and Nathan got some really interesting results. Can I get the little perisher to publish it? <laughs> He's moved on. He's got a job. He doesn't need to publish it. Yeah. So we need some data. There was certainly some really interesting, like, I mean, in my garden, you know, I, I record some really interesting hoverflies at six o'clock in the afternoon in a yeah. summer's day, you know, um, and, you know, they're never there in the daytime. They're just sitting on some leaves, sunbathing just before dusk. Yep. And, uh, you know, there's no track of them otherwise. And then I, I just posted earlier on, like today, you know, at midday, there were loads of hoverflies around, even in Northumberland. But yep. by 3.30... You know, it was Aristalis and Episurface, you know. You were doing well, Mark. I got nothing at 3.30. Oh, well, it was... <laughs> Mind it you, was I was in the pub. Yeah, <laughs> it, was quite, it was bright sunshine. And, you know, it was still quite warm. And I, I yeah, you yeah. know, I was just trying my second ivy patch. And I was surprised there wasn't more. But, um, yeah, anyway, yeah. There, there's a whole lot of stuff that just... In my garden, there's a whole bunch of stuff that just sunbathes in the evening. And I never yeah. see them otherwise, you know, yeah. Well, it would be really fascinating to capture that, mm. you know, um, and not just a one-off one day. But, you know, if you get that over the year, it'll t it'll tell a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, uh, in, which is... Can't count. In, yes, well, it, well, I was just going to kind of re reiterate that, really, because, because in my garden, you know, I'm, I'm lucky uh, my, my house is uh, south facing and um it's in the hills but it's a uh, stone you know it's an old stone house and of course the, that south facing stone wall um that's the place to look and there i find a hoverflies are you saying mark you know um maybe they're in my garden somewhere or neighbor's garden but uh have but you know they just love that they love that um you know the warmth there that's built up during the late afternoon or during the day on that on that stone mm. wall 
And um, yeah, so anyway, just just a comment about that, really. It, it's like a giant storage heater, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It also attracts, but we're not talking about those. But it also is the place to look for moths. Oh uh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Moths as well, and that storm. I mean, I haven't read about it anywhere, but that I suppose it's the heat from the house or something coming out. Yep. But yep. you know that that yep. was marvelous, you know. Yeah, I had six um, December moths there this morning. Wow. <laughs> so, but anyway, I digress. So. One of the things you might do is actually get one of these um, temperature gauges. You know the things the NHS use for um, checking your temperature? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, if you looked at the, the, the temperature of the stones on your house and then around the, the garden, I bet you'll find that it's three or four degrees higher. Yeah, well, that would be interesting. Yeah, it yeah. must be significant. And yeah, but I didn't realize when I bought my house that I'd actually chosen a house with a south facing uh, stone wall, you know, <laughs> but it's the main part of the building. <laughs> Excellent. Thinking about what Roger was saying, do we, do we need the ability to tag a sighting so that? If you were doing a regular garden walk, you gave it some kind of label, so essentially all those sightings could be grouped together in some way at some point in the future. I As think I think that's the concept of a site, isn't it? And you know, I'm sure Chris and Roger can tell you about the nightmare that we have with sites um, because <laughs> people. And, and I, I'm guilty. I've, I looked in the um, in my post and, and I've labeled one of my sites differently on iRecord and um, you know I've got Avenue Park and Avenue Park 1 because I initially started out with individual <laughs> squares and but Yanis and I aren't bothered about that because we know we can tag any sort of site information onto a point later it could you know it doesn't doesn't have to be but but yeah it, but it's that, that that only, I guess that only does a, a site it doesn't do a you were doing a particular walk along a particular wall or something like that and you don't yeah i mean that that, 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 that would, do. that's what i was saying about you know if you've got different um recording styles like so if you go out for a long walk and you you might break that up as roger was mentioning to me earlier but that's not something i've done yet i've not gone on a big mission to try and <laughs> record everything on the transit but um yeah it, it, as long as you could uniquely flag it and we can obviously do that as you know the observation would be rather than just a single grid reference it might be something else well the sort of thing i would i mean what i i do an almost uh, uh, uh the same walk every day in the autumn and in the spring actually that doesn't matter um and the, the best way of dealing with that is to either have certain points that you record at because most of us find that you know on our walk there'll be a certain place which is a sunspot or there'll be an aggregation of flowers mm -hmm. or something like that and so i tend to record at that point and then i'll move on and then if i enter a 1k square that from the start of it to the end of it i'm picking up records well i just do at one kilometer level so tq 2866 is one that i regularly do and then i'll move into the next square and there's only 100 meters of it that's any use for recording so i do that 100 meters mm -hmm. and then i move into another square and there's two ivy bushes in 200 meters so okay i'll choose a central point between them and that's a grid reference for them so that's the sort of approach that i would take it i think i think we get we can get too bogged down in um, trying to be absolute with grid references. And the problem we have there is if you've got a single record, you can get a grid reference down to maybe 10 meters square um, because even GPS isn't that reliable. Um, but if you've got 10 records and you've moved around and you've picked up a few records here and there, well, the best you're going to do is 100 meters square so we've got, a, I think my message is about an element of pragmatism, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that it's much more important to record the behavior and the food plant than the exact square. I mean, you know, if it's 10 meters or 100 meters, it probably doesn't matter. But if it's um, recorded, I mean, I, I'm just looking at Brachiopia is the one that has appeared in my garden yeah, yep. several times, you know, sunning itself in the evening. Now, yep. uh, you know, I'm guessing that I wouldn't find that as a flower, 
it's a sap feeder, is it? You know, I, I'm a beginner. Unusually. Um, yeah. So yeah, I just, I just find it like yeah, sitting on the album meeting in the evening. Um, yeah. It would be more important to record, not just the fact that it was in my garden, but it was on elm leaves in the evening, yeah, than yeah. that it was on the dandelions in the middle of the day. Yeah. And so I, I would suggest you have two fields, if this is not too complex. One, behaviour. Yep. And two, um, plant. Obviously, your plant is going to be a little bit limited by who's you know recording it, but it could just be simple like, a daisy type plant, you know, yellow daisy or um, umbella for, or, yeah. um, you know, most people know the tree species or, or, or you could leave it blank. You don't have to record it, but behavior and, um, or where found and, you know, something like that. And that would well, give I think, I think the notes detail. field will do that. Um, it, it's the, the, the question we then have is extracting the data. Now, yeah. when it goes into the hoverfly recording data set, um, we, we have a fairly limited set of fields that we can do that on. So what Stuart has to do is he has to string together a whole range of things into a string, um, but in such a way that he can then search on them. Um, so, yes, I agree with you, Mark. I think you're absolutely right about capturing behavioral issues. And in particular, um, we get a lot of requests these days from research teams saying, can you give us all your flower records, flower visit records? And I wrote back and I say, no, I can't, I'm afraid, because we have some. But, for example, we get people saying on ivy, but we don't know whether it's on ivy flowers or yeah. on the leaves. And yeah. whether if it's on the flowers, it's actually doing anything or it's just sitting there. Um, so, for example, with the... Um, with the data that we extract, as you know, we, we extract and say at such and such flowers, um, mm. which, is, which is, is the moniker that I use in the data set to say it was, it was visiting flowers, it was doing something. We can't tell whether it was nectaring or taking pollen. Um, but then when we go through the data set and say, well, here's something saying on ivy, and I go through it. And, well, it's on ivy, but it's in February. Mm. <laughs> you know? Well, it's not at flowers, is it? Yeah. Um, and I, I, so we, I think one of the things we've got to do there is probably develop a series of conventions that people understand. A series of drop downs. Drop downs are your friend. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So you limit what people can enter. Yes. Oh, yeah. But, but if you're going to do it, you could extract that from the comments, but you'd have to have some rules that, um, you know, people use the same conventions all the time. It would have to yeah. be written in the guidance. It would be far safer to do it as a drop down. But, you know, that is extra information that you're asking well, people to gather. And that's the. Suggest, rather than just comments, which is vague and unclassifiable, I would suggest you have a couple of different drop down boxes that cover as many of the. I mean, I, you know, You'd need more thought on exactly what they cover, but have us cover the two or three main elements, mm. uh, you know, so that, yeah, behavior, I would say behavior and plant would be two things and they could be optional. You wouldn't have to fill them in because a lot of people wouldn't know those things, but it would give you a lot more data. Yeah. Okay. I've just seen a comment um, from Paul Stevens about the um, about time of day and potentially recording the same things twice. Roger, did you want to sort of say anything about that? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not too worried about recording the same animal eight times in a day. If it's if it tells us that that animal has been active over that period, then that's actually quite useful. Now we can still computationally we can deal with that problem because um, we can basically say a record for that day from that location represents a unique record from uh, one set of analytical processes. But the fact that that animal has been active for eight hours is actually a separate bit of useful information that tells us the, the duration of the activity of the animal in question. Um, and that leads also into a better understanding of, you know, the, the, the timescales over which hoverflies are, are particularly active. So 
at the moment, if you look at a lot of the data, you would find that most hoverflies are most active between, uh, now I'm, I'm quoting this for sort of May, June time, they'd be most active between about 9.30 in the morning and probably at the latest one o'clock. And then there's a dip and they're much less active in the heat of the afternoon and they rise again around about three o'clock, four o'clock. And as Mark was commenting, there you, you quite often find there's actually quite a spike as, as, as the sun drops and the temperature drops a little bit, but it falls more into the active period for the hoverflies. So in the, in the evening, you'll get them sun basking and you actually see them more often. So it's that sort of understanding of the what they're doing that's actually quite important. Um, and, and I think in terms of starting to look at the effects of heat waves and things like that, that may actually be very, very important. Do we actually see that pattern replicated? Do we see the pattern interrupted so that they're only active first thing in the morning and last thing at night? Or do we just not see them? And is the reason we're not seeing them that they're not there or they've hidden themselves? These are lots and lots of questions that at the moment we just can't answer them. Um, so I'm hoping that if we get these sorts of data, we will start to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Just relating to the previous um, thing we were discussing, would it be useful, uh, Carol says, about um, including habitat photos? Um, I think some people do, do, do include habitat photos already, don't they, um, in the posts? Um, it, it's always nice to see them in the posts. But the problem that we always have with habitat is actually coming up with a standardized description that's... Yeah sufficiently meaningful that separates out and explains why the animal's there because the 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 hoverfly is the mobile stage so <clears throat> we don't necessarily or we can't necessarily associate the animal with that habitat what we do know is it's active in that habitat what we don't know is whether it's active in that habitat and utilizing that habitat other than either in transit or because it's a good flower visit site. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the big, the big issue really is how on earth do you capture it? I, I remember from the data cards that we used to enter, we used to have people that would put on uh, un, under the, in the habitat box and they'd say fields, hedgerows, roads, woodlands. Um, and, and by the time you've got that, well, it's meaningless. Yeah, and it's also harder to do. Yeah, it, for that reason, it's harder to do those bigger sort of transect type things. Um, you know, unless you're stopping and and you know breaking it up into segments. Yes, you have to break them down into segments yeah. if you want to make close associations between distribution and habitat. But what you can do is, and I think this is where Andy's work really comes in, is that if you've got good and I would say six-figure, not 10-figure grid references, good six-figure grid references, then you can start to link um, occurrence with aspects of um, physical geography. So is it on a south-facing slope? Is it on a north-facing slope? Um, is it on a steep slope? Is it within a, a woodland ride? Those sorts of things. Um, we, can, we can make some of those... Uh, 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 assessments from the grid reference and the geospatial element of it. But we've got to have a lot of data to try and do anything with it. You can't do a lot with one or two records. You've got to have an awful lot of records to start to do something. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? I've got a question. Go for it. What does it say on my screen, the name? Sander Patterson. Patterson. Well, that's my son. I'm Callum. I'm just using uh, his Mac. So. Ah, it's you. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> I'm you. I'm interested in about this recording of the weather because it's 
I've tried it and it's actually harder, especially when you're out when you're out all day than it's than you would imagine. Um, I mean, how do people do that when they're out? Especially the temperature. Yeah, I I, I would agree with you. I mean, that trying to quantify it into such a way that we can use it is always going to be difficult. So. Um, what Andy's done is he's broken it down into some fairly simple descriptions. Now, of course, that's no different to the, the usual problem. We have a day four scale. You know, if you start with a five point day four scale, it's not very long before you start saying, well, that's four and a half, you know, and then you say, OK, well, that's a 10 point day four scale. So and, and then you get to, oh, well, that's is it an eight or a nine? <laughs> and, right. and so you put eight and a half and you're always in that sort of problem. Um, so, again, it comes back to, I think we, we have to be realistic about what we can capture. But if we can start to get a feeling for when things are definitely active and when they're not active. So, for example, a bit of, a bit of light cloud with intermittent sunshine and you might see things. But if it's black cloud overhead, well, you're not going to see a lot. Or are you? And. It's is it not possible to pull the data, the weather data, using the grid reference from somewhere else? Yeah, Yanis might want to say something about that because we've got something similar to that in our Vine system. So there's, that's an API, isn't it? The a weather API that you pull. Yes, yes, there is a weather API where you can give your position and then acquire information about temperature, about humidity, about all kind of stuff you need. So it could be automatically done if, if you know the position, you could retrieve it automatically. So that would be at least more consistent, you know, because somebody might be looking yes. at their phone and, you know, the, the temperature or they might might have something more sophisticated. But but that way, at least you standardize it and we could just feed that as a value into the um, into the system. Yeah. And yeah, OK, that's useful. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's but is that actually, only if they if they enter the the records from their phone in the field, or can you? It just like, needs a grid reference. So I don't okay. know what the resolution of the weather model is, but um, can you remember, Yanis? Sorry, putting you on the spot a lot here. No, no. But if they if they enter their records a week later or six months later, as long as they've got the grid reference, we yeah, can okay. we can attach the value oh, yeah. to it in theory. Is it, I, guess, I guess there's how far back can you go though, Yanis? Is it um it depends. Usually they give a few months back in their standard API calls, and then you can get historical data about several years, but it's another process. But in principle, you can get data of uh, further back time. And and you know, and that goes for all sorts of other data. You know, once you've got the geographical position, you could characterize the square and there's loads of stuff you could do. As, as Roger said, we, we tend to do that. And, and our, our, the Vine tool that I showed earlier, um, you know, it was looking at slope and aspect criteria for suitability to plant up a new vineyard. And all of those methods could be applied to, you know, tree cover or habitat maps. And, and then you could start to do all sorts of interesting things. But, but this one at least is a, a kind of a good indicator because it's, um, it's it's saying something that could be directly related on a graph, maybe. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, still got a few questions um, uh, and or comments. So yeah, this thing about um, being able to Josie explore the species list per hectare tetrad, we can aggregate those sorts of things again based on the position that's provided. So you know, in our um, I've got another. Um, you know, just quickly share something with you. This is very quick, but um, we've got a, a system that we were looking at noise um, impacts of the new runway at Heathrow. And um, so we, we've got the ability to aggregate at different spatial scales. This is using a hexagon and you can sort of have in these interactive sliders where you can change a threshold value. In this case, it's the noise value. So these are the populations that are affected by different noise levels and um, you can you can use that aggregation so we could have that on this little head I think these are 500 meters but you know we could do it at 10 kilometers or you know county scale or you know they were often being asked to um, report things to um, 
MPs. So the MPs always wanted to know how many people in my constituency are going to be impacted by noise, and um, you can you can aggregate on those levels. So there's all sorts of clever things we can do. Um, it's just trying to work out, you know, what um, what 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 um, what the what the, the main um, main goal is. Yeah, I think at this stage. Um there's a lot that we we might do as technology changes i think we we kind of have to sort of say we start by trying to run uh rather than expecting to sprint 100 meters in 9.3 seconds um and if 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 we're doing 100 meters in 15 seconds then we're we're probably doing pretty well um but we'll learn as we go along. Um, I noticed C Carol Driver's comment um, about cameras recording metadata. Um, so I don't know if, if 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 you've got any thoughts on that, Andy or Yanis. Um, Yanis is Yanis is developing something for our Vine customer at the moment, which has that utilizes that information. Oh, really? Not, not from a phone, but uh, not from a camera. Like yeah. this, this is, I've got a TG six, I think it is, or five. Yeah, yeah. Um, as well, it's the same. If, yeah. if you upload the camera photograph and it has metadata about position or any other metadata, yes, it can be used to fit the the corresponding fields uh, and uh, auto populate the information. But presumably that's data that wouldn't get uploaded to a post on Facebook. It would be data that um, uh, would be lost in that process, would it? No, the, the thought is that the system could generate the post. So another, another workflow would be instead of creating the post yourself manually, entering the comments and everything, you could upload the image and the system would create the post for you yep. and that's the information of the, the position, uh, a, a typical post as you do it and allow then the users to comment and uh, be exactly as it would be if you would do it manually. Right. Yeah, you still have to add the identification on top or your provisional identification, but, but yeah, in theory, we could gather all of that information automatically. So, you know, that's typically what I would do. I would, I would come home, download everything off the camera, chuck it in a folder for that particular day and location, and then eventually get around to posting it on Facebook, the ones that were, um, that I needed some help with and, <laughs> And then the rest would just go into the spreadsheet, yeah. and yeah. and eventually it's got a feedback from the post into the spreadsheet. So it's a it's a bit of a manual process. And at the very least, I'm I'm sure that we can develop something that will make spreadsheet recording easier. But I think what what Yanis is saying is there's so much potential to hook up into yeah. the Facebook, and and yeah. to generate stuff. This could be a batch mode that you refer to. So let's say I go out and take my photos, put it in a folder, and then say pass the folder create a list with the photographs, and then you go to at each photograph and you say, okay, this was this species, this count, this species, this count. So go the other way around. Instead of populating the, the observations and attach the images, start from the images and attach the information. Yeah, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure it can be improved. I guess the, the danger is creating massive posts with large numbers of images. Well, that is a danger, yes. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> But no, it, it, there's there's definitely um, scope uh, for, for that. I'm sure. Is there not some problem with um, the problems with Facebook with that though? Because it's been proving increasingly problematic in terms of its quirkiness, um, the way Facebook behaves from one day to the next changes oh, in yeah. terms of the way people upload their photos, the way they can label their photos. I mean, that sounds amazing that it just automatically pings over. But even when people do it manually at the minute, massive problems. It's like any interface yeah. with the system, you know, we, we, we can't tell Facebook what to do. Things change. I mean, normally with APIs and, and communication between systems, there's some notification that they're going to change it. You know, Yanis is down as a developer on Facebook now. It, it's, this is a Facebook app um, that, that I, I, you know, and and you're always, you're always as a developer um, 
going to struggle when when people update their APIs without telling you. I mean, look at our COVID dashboard. I mean, we we did a COVID map, and the the how many times I, I um you know the people who Public Health England changed their the way they published the data. Yanis was probably ready to to kill somebody at one point. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's, but, but you know there's nothing you can do about that so you have to build and hope that they publish stuff in, in time for you to be able to adapt and um, usually they give a bit of notice but, but if it's like Public Health England maybe not um, conscious of time um, and people are having to drop off and, and you know I'd love to, to talk all night about this but um, we probably ought to wrap this up um, I guess what it has shown is it, um, it's really valuable to come together as a, as a group and talk about this because, you know, there's a lot of experience here and, you know, this is only really the start of the conversation. We need to work out where we go from, from here. And um, I think, you know, what is clear is that we need to look around a bit more at what, what else is there and, and what benefits there are and, and how, if we are going to build something, we, we, we do it to make it distinctive and to make it make a difference to what we're trying to do in the scheme. And, to make it easier yeah. but you know you've seen at least some of the potential and i think it's now for us to take stock and anybody wants to to feedback um um more you know i can uh, provide in the chat my email address and um you know we can, we can carry up on the uh, the discussion but um yeah i don't know roger do you want to say anything before we close well, I think I think the main thing I would say is just a huge thank you to everyone who's who's logged in and made a contribution, or simply just listened in. Because yeah. those that haven't contributed, um, they're still really valuable because they've actually made that effort to to hear what's going on. Um, that will have an impact at some point. So, yeah. a, a huge thank you. Yeah, very much appreciate your time and and your feedback. It means a lot, and 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 it's great to put some faces to names, as 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 um, I just said at the start. You know, I, I've seen you all virtually <laughs> at some point on the on the Facebook page. But yeah, it's just nice to to say hello and and yeah, let's do it again soon. <laughs> yeah. Can Can I just uh, Mark's just put up a a point about working with other schemes at the moment no we're not working with other schemes but um, clearly if this platform uh, works then there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be uh, adapted for other schemes um, one of the things that we do need to bear in mind and i think this is is pretty crucial actually is that uh, um, andy and yanis are are a commercial company they're doing this um, as an experiment with us um, and we are hugely indebted to them for the time that they're putting in uh, so i think we have to be quite careful about how we manage the process um, if this turns out to be a popular platform i would i would like to see some commercial benefit to to andy and yanis um, clearly this sort of computing doesn't come cheap um, and it takes some very, very special skills. Um, I, I, I spent some time with Andy and Yanis last week and I just came back absolutely gobsmacked at what, what could be done. Um, but it, there's not many people that can do it. Um, and, you know, I think my hat goes off to, to Yanis for what he can do. It's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so a huge sure. thank you to both Andy and and, and Yanis for that. Uh, you're welcome. As I say, um, I, I'm probably dragging Yanis along. You, I'm, <laughs> I'm converted already, but um, oh, we want to see a Greek hoverfly. Yeah, yeah, screen. we're, we're going to get um, Yanis <laughs> to post some pictures of really fancy hoverflies he gets over there. Absolutely. I, yeah, but that that also with mosquitoes here. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We didn't <laughs> mention. Part of another project with uh, with some companies that work on uh, uh, counting uh, the the mosquitoes and then making uh, uh, interventions to to limit how they are. So we, we had a case where we were working with an application, a mobile application about mosquitoes, and then a web application that would. Uh, uh, create dashboards and so things on maps and things like that. And <laughs> I, I have seen some things, but not on the hover flies. So it's very interesting for me. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Cool. It just it just raises the issue of sustainability though. 
you know, I mean, you know, it's fantastic. I mean, I, you know, I can sense that you're incredible scientists working in your field, and you know, the fact that you're working on the the um, COVID and all that kind of stuff is is obviously evidence of that. But then, you know, if we set this up and we can't find funding to support you, then what is the sustainability? Because it, you know, there needs to be some sustainability. Uh, yeah, it's a fair question, and and I think you know for for the time being, this is a prototype. You know, we've done it, and and you know we're happy to fund it and to you know to try and take it as far as we can. I think you know ultimately we'd like to to get this a a, a, a proper grant to do it properly. You know, yeah. we we can only devote so much time, yeah. and you know that might involve us having to go into a competitive process. Well, bring it on. You know, we're we're, we're happy to to bid That's for scientists. work. But um, you know, it, it it depends on what the fund, funding source is available. But but yeah, it, you know, it's it's not so much our time, certainly not my time that we'd be looking to cover. And you know, Yanis has given a lot of his time as as well. It's more things like when when you when you start to upload photos, you need storage, and and that's where you start to incur some costs. So. It's just about we probably if we could use this as a demonstrator, a lot of the times we'd be looking to just cover our costs and 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 to showcase it to other people. So that it, it, I hope that and, and the fact that I'm, you know, involved in the scheme and I'm actively recording hopefully gives you some reassurance that I'm not just some charlatan trying to no, 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 leverage no. the day to set. It, you know, these, these things need like, we, you know, we need 20 years. Yeah. Um, you know, once you get this going, you need 10 or 20 years of um, sustenance here. Um, and I, I, you know, that is really important. So we should no, it's a fair question. find some funding but, that supports that long term. And, you know, I, th I think we've, uh, I think we, we, we've simply got to um, prove that the system works, show that it's well supported. And at that point, we then have the issue about um, long term support for the um, for the for the the web hosting and 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 the related work. Um, what I would hope is that if this actually starts to work, that we we see some interest from a variety of other um, parties, so that. Um, the use of Facebook as a uh, as a biological recording community actually grows, and therefore there's a demand for the package. Um, now that was I was hoping we I mean we had Voot uh, part of the group, but I was hoping that Frank van der Muter might have been around, but he's he's tied up. Um, it's possible that there will be a lot more interest in Europe. Um, and we don't know if 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 it's if it's a, if it's a, an effective package, we may get BRC on in, on board, and we may well get some sponsorship. Um, at the moment, the hoverfly recording scheme is basically funded by Stuart and me, and Stuart basically uh, pays the cost of the the website, and between us, we cover up some of the other costs. Um, <clears throat> Clearly, when we drop off our purchase, someone else has got to take over, and we don't want to leave it unsustainable. So, yes, we we are going to have to look at those issues, but we we'll meet those problems as we approach them, um, and and we'll find solutions. We've got to. <laughs> but it, it, at the moment, I think what we're I think if I read you correctly, Andy and Yanis, this provides a way of showcasing what you can do yeah and my answer then is for goodness sake go out and use it and showcase to clients you know that's fantastic uh and if you need the the hrs data set to do that it's there to do it great okay that's excellent well that's been fantastic thank you everybody um Really good to see you all. Really useful feedback. And as I say, if you've got any more comments after, um, please do email me. And um, yeah, we'll perhaps put the slides up on the on the file section for people to have a look at as well. But, yeah. And I have to say, it's great to put names to faces. Fantastic. We ought to do more of this. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. <laughs> Next time, I'm going to be the one sitting there watching with a beer in my hand.
I'll tell you what, we ought to have the UK Hoverflies Christmas party. There you go. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Let's do it. We we could do it. <laughs> Why not? Mm. There's a date. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay. All Cheers. right. Bye. Have a good Cheers evening. Then. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.